Now, we return you to your narrator, Bob Sloan, and the big story of Bob Early as he lived it and wrote it. You, Bob Early of the Indianapolis Star, leave the speedway and go out to the high school road where the burned-out car is located. You've been around and you've seen a lot of things that aren't very pretty, but you can't help wincing when you see the charred corpse, silent and dead, sitting behind the wheel. Your friend, Sheriff Frank Brophy, has been on the scene for some time, and he gives you a quick opinion. Nothing much left here but the chassis and corpse, Bob. Looks like one of those things. Oh, you mean uh, accident? Uh-huh. Poor devil hit this ditch, and his car probably exploded under him. Never had a chance to get out. You know who the driver is, Frank? Not yet. We're checking the license plates with the Alabama Bureau of Motor Vehicles. Mm. I took the prowl car with a report to my office any minute now. Well, all I can say is that this is one sweet mess. Must have been a hot fire while... Oh, hey, Frank. Yes? Uh, take a look at this, will you? I found it on what used to be the back seat of the car. Hmm. Looks like a charred piece of yellow raincoat. It is. We used to call them slickers in the old days. There's some artwork on it. Here you can see a heart drawn on it with an arrow going through. A couple of Greek letters. Delta, theta, something. All of which doesn't prove much. Oh, here's that prowl car. Let's have that report, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Thanks. Now, let's take a look. Hmm. Name, Carl Kennedy. Residence, South Hamilton Street, Mobile, Alabama. Hair brown, eyes brown, age 39, height 5. Hey, Frank, wait a minute. Yeah? How old did you say this Carl Kennedy was? 39. Why, anything wrong? Yeah, there could be. There could be plenty wrong. What do you mean? I mean that scrap of yellow raincoat with the decorations on it. Well, what about it? Frank, how old are you? Makes any difference. I'm 40, but what Would is you that? wear a yellow raincoat decorated with stuff like hearts and arrows and Greek fraternity letters? Oh, are you kidding? That's for high school kids or college freshmen, maybe, but for a man might. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. See what I mean, Frank? Yeah. Yeah. Carl Kennedy, the driver of this car, was about my age. He wouldn't have been wearing a raincoat like this. Check. And if he wasn't wearing it, someone else was. Someone riding with him. All of which proves one thing. What's that? This could have been just an accident. And then again, it could have been murder. Well, Bob, I just got an autopsy report from the medical examiner. And? And you had the right angle. And it was murder. Yeah, Carl Kennedy was dead before his car was set on fire. The medical examiner did a lung examination and found one of them pierced. Whoever did Kennedy in knifed him. Not a very nice story, is it? No. Uh, Frank. Yeah? Uh, a question. Shoot. How do we know that charred corpse behind the wheel is Carl Kennedy? We checked with his wife on the long-distance phone to Mobile. He was headed for the races here, all right. Still, it could have been someone else sitting behind the wheel. We don't know for sure. Nobody could ever identify that corpse. Mrs. Kennedy's statement is good enough for me. Why should it be anyone else? I don't know. I don't know. I just had a hunch on a long shot, that's all. Me, I'm going to talk to Dan Martin, my editor. What about? About a trip way down south to Mobile. So, you talk to your city editor. You tell him you've been riding a lucky streak and that this trip is just a gamble. Sure, you're gambling. But you're a reporter, too. And you've got a nose for a story. And the smell of this story is already tickling your nostrils. And you know it can be big. Big. If your hunch is right. At the last moment, Sheriff Brophy decided to go south with you. So you travel together. In Mobile, you find that Mrs. Kennedy is out of town for a day or two. You also find, through a neighbor, that there's another woman. Her name is Marge Redman, and she lives in a cheap slum neighborhood. You and Brophy talked to her for what it's worth. How well did you know Carl Kennedy, Miss Redden? We were friends. Good friends? Just friends. Well, what do you want me to do, cry in my beer? I was sorry to hear about Carl. He was a nice guy. What else can I say? When did you see him last? Just before he left for the race in Indianapolis. Did he seem nervous, upset about anything? No, he was just excited. He had a sure winner picked out for the race. A what winner? I think the driver's name was Red Rhodes. Uh-huh. The favorite he lost. Oh, uh, Miss Redmond. Yes? You going on a trip somewhere? 
Why did you ask that? Oh, nothing, nothing. Just noticed the pile of travel folders on your table here. They all seem to be about South America. Look, where I go is my business, isn't it? Sure, sure, but I... And I'm tired of answering a lot of crazy questions. I don't know anything about this whole thing, and I don't care. Why come to me in the first place? Why don't you talk to Carl's wife? We plan to do just that. Anything else you want to know? No, not at the moment. Then get out. Both of you. I got things to do. Well, Frank, what do you think? Interesting, but a waste of time. Was it? I wonder. You wonder what? I wonder how a woman living in a cheap, crummy boarding house like this could afford a trip to South America. And first class at that. How do you know it was first class? She had the first class rates ringed in pencil. And another thing, Frank. Huh? They were the rates for two. Well, it's nothing much. A straw in the wind, maybe. But a straw just big enough to tickle that nose of yours. That nose for a big story. So you keep pushing your luck. Meanwhile, Sheriff Brophy checks the insurance companies and he finds that Carl Kennedy's life is insured for $10,000. $20,000 in case of accident. And that's interesting, although not conclusive. Finally, when Mrs. Kennedy returns, you both go up and talk to her. Poor Carl. He was so excited when he left for Indianapolis. He was like a small boy. He went, well, it was a vacation for him. No, no, he did. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kennedy. I know how you must feel. These questions are just routine. Of course, I, I understand. The awful part of it was that I let him go alone. Carl would have been so happy if he'd come back with all that money he would have won. We were planning a trip to South America. South America? Yes. Oh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy, did you say your husband would have won a lot of money? Why, yes. You see, Carl... Well, he loved auto races. He followed them in the newspapers all the time, and he knew just the drivers who were going to win. He told you who the winners were going to be before he left? No, but he wrote me all about it. I have this letter right in this envelope here, here on my table. I see. And he picked the winners beforehand. Why, yes. Here, I'll, I'll read you what he said. Mm -hmm. Dear Ethel, I'm writing this letter from Louisville, Kentucky. In a few hours, I'll be in Indianapolis just in time for the race. Keep your fingers crossed on that South American trip. I've got the winners all figured out, and they can't lose. I've picked Betty Taylor to come in first, Al Kelly second, and Red Road third. You've heard enough, and now you know. So does Frank Brophy. And when you get outside... Frank, that's it. My long shot came in. Carl Kennedy is alive. It sure looks that way. It's got to be that way. He wrote that letter after the Speedway race. It's a thousand to one that nobody could have picked those two long shots. One, two. Over Red Road's the favorite without being there or hearing about it afterwards. And Marge Redman told us Kennedy had picked Rhodes to win beforehand. Still, there is that thousand to one chance. No, no, Frank, not even that. I caught a look at the postmark on the envelope. And? And although it was supposed to have been mailed from Louisville, it was postmarked from Indianapolis at 10 o'clock that night, hours after the race was over. Hmm. No wonder I couldn't find that hitchhiker. He was the corpse behind the wheel. And Carl Kennedy was the killer. A nice little gimmick for collecting the insurance later. Ah, uh, very pretty. Bob, about this insurance. It's in his wife's name, right? Right. And naturally, if Carl Kennedy's alive, and he is, he's going to come back and collect it. Naturally. And naturally, we'll just stick around here in Mobile and welcome him home. <laughs> Sheriff Brophy begin a watch on the Kennedy house from a clump of weeds in the vacant lot next door. A night passes, then another. And finally, on the third night, you're almost ready to call it quits. When you see a man coming down the street, a black shadow against the night, moving toward the house. He stops a moment. Looks around. And then he starts walking again and turns into the house itself. Get 
outside. Carl, Carl. Shut up and get inside of them. You and Sheriff Brophy crawl through the weeds and over to the open window. And you listen. Oh, Carl. Carl, I thought you were dead. Why not now? Did you get the money? Money? Yeah, yeah, the money from the insurance company. Did you get it, Ethel? Yes, yes, I did. Give it to me. Carl, that man in the car, the man who was burned. Never mind, Tim. Give me that money. I haven't got much time. Carl, you killed him. You killed him for the insurance money. Oh, Carl, Carl, why did you do it? Why did you do it? Now, listen, Ethel. Stop whining and listen. Nobody knows I did it. You understand? Nobody knows. You got to keep your mouth shut, understand? Carl. We'll split the money 50 50, 10,000 for you, 10 for me. I'll drop out of sight. I'll go to South America. You just sit tight and keep quiet. No. Carl, no, you can't do it. You, you killed a man, murdered him, burned him. Are you going to give me that door, aren't you? Carl, no. Okay. I killed once, I can do it all over again. You hear me, Ethel? I can do it all over again. In fact, maybe I will. Why not? Why should I split the dough with you? And who's going to suspect me as you kill? Huh? Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's right. I can't kill anybody. I'm dead. I burned to death, remember? Oh, oh no. Don't. No. I better, Ethel. Now that you know, it's a little dangerous having you around. Yeah. It's a little too dangerous. Carl, please. No, Carl, no! What? Who's that? I'll introduce myself later, Kennedy, but right now I wouldn't make a move if I were you. Unless you want to argue with the business end of this guy. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll read you a telegram from Bob Early of the Indianapolis Star with the final outcome of tonight's big story. The cigarette that's really different. The longer, finer cigarette that's really outstanding. Pell-Mell famous cigarette. Good to look at. Good to feel. Good to taste. And good to smoke. Yes, Pell-Mells are good to look at, good to feel, good to taste, and good to smoke. Four notes that are alike, and one that is outstanding. And of America's leading cigarettes, one is outstanding. The longer, finer cigarette in the distinguished red package. Pell-Mell famous cigarettes, outstanding. And they are mild. Now we read you that telegram from Robert Early of the Indianapolis Star. Killer in tonight's big story not only failed to collect insurance on his life, but because of his admissions couldn't even collect fire insurance on his car, was convicted and sentenced to the Indiana State Prison. Many thanks for tonight's Pell-Mell Award. Thank you, Mr. Early. The makers of Pell-Mell famous cigarettes are proud to have named you the winner of the Pell-Mell $500 Award for notable service in the field of journalism. Listen again next week, same time, same station when Pell-Mell Famous Cigarettes will present another big story. A big story from the front pages of the Minneapolis Morning Tribune. Byline, Ralph K. Mills. A big story that began late one night in an empty lot when a reporter found a pair of silk stockings with legs in them. The Big Story is produced by Bernard J. Proctor with music by Vladimir Selinsky. Tonight's program was written by Max Ehrlich. Your narrator was Bob Sloan and John Sylvester played the part of Bob Early. In order to protect the names of people actually involved in tonight's authentic Big Story, the names of all characters in the dramatization were changed with the exception of the reporter, Mr. Early. This is Ernest Chappell speaking for the makers of Pell Mell Famous Cigarettes. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.